Yeah. What? Yeah. I don't know. Those are the ones that I got. I actually, I remember I didn't get one from you. Yeah. I remembered you being in class, so I gave you the point, but I didn't get one from you. Hello, everyone. Let's start. Uh, homework six is due on Sunday, and I need to make an adjustment to the assignment. Um, on problem two, there's many steps. And in one of the steps, I ask you to calculate the sludge volume. And so uh, that part is optional. You don't need to complete the sludge volume portion. I put some resources on iLearn if you do want to uh, give it a try. And uh, if you do, then the points will be, uh, there'll be some extra credit points for trying that. But it's optional. So we've got an exam coming up on Tuesday. And there's both concepts and problem solving on that exam. I split it up into two, two different papers, actually. First, you'll take the concept questions. And for the concept questions, you can't use your equation sheet. It's just from your memory. And then you'll give me the concept questions. I'll give you the next page, which is problem solving. And for the problem solving, you can use the equation sheet. So those are two very distinct sets of the, uh, of the exam. As far as how many points are on each section, usually what I do is I put about two-thirds of the points on problem solving and about one-third of the points related to comprehension, concepts, fundamentals, that sort of thing. Yeah, we're going to have the exam inside this classroom at our normal scheduled uh, class time. You can prepare an equation sheet. It should be limited to one sheet of paper, a normal size piece of paper. It's not a poster. Okay? And uh, if you like, you can write on both sides of the paper, but only one paper. Are there other questions about the midterm exam? Yes? Um, everything's included from lecture one, including uh, through today's lecture and the lecture that we're going to have on Sunday. So it'll be classes one through 15. Yes? Everything is included. Yeah, right. OK, well, today we're talking about sedimentation. And let's review what the water treatment process looks like for a surface water. This is the diagram that um, shows what's happening with surface water. And usually, surface water is the most challenging for us to get clean and safe to drink. Groundwater is a little bit more simple because usually groundwater is isolated from human activity. So groundwater wouldn't have the same kind of diseases and turbidity. Uh, the turbidity usually comes from runoff. But the point is surface water is harder to clean up. So that's what we'll focus on, the thing that's more difficult. Just as an overview, the raw water comes in and we add chemicals for coagulation. Does any re anybody remember what are the two chemicals that are most commonly used for coagulation? Alum is one of them. Ferric chloride is the other. What is special about those two chemicals? Why are they used instead of sodium chloride? Trivalent, right. You know, you could use uh, sodium chloride for destabilization of those particles to neutralize the negative charge but it's much less effective than alum or ferric chloride. So coagulation is the process of making the negative charge canceled out. Flocculation is the step where we're stirring in progressively lower energy levels. Why do we start to become gentle with the, uh, with the water towards the end of flocculation? Right. You don't want to break that flock apart. Why do you want a big flock? Why does it matter if the particles are together or if they're by themselves? What's so special about getting them together? Why is that desirable? They settle faster. Right. We're going to look at an equation today that allows us to calculate the settling velocity of particles. And what you'll see from that equation is the diameter of the particle is a very important parameter to how quickly it settles downward. So that's what we're going to be looking at in sedimentation today. Um, 
just as some overview basics, the water usually will spend between two and eight hours inside of the clarifier. Sometimes we call it a settlement basin, sometimes we call it a clarifier. There's no technical difference between the two. They mean the same thing and those phrases are used interchangeably. So we have to have pretty big clarifiers because the water's spending a long time in there. Rather than making one enormous clarifier, if you take an aerial photo of a water treatment plant, they'll usually have lots of them. And they're still pretty big, but instead of having one gigantic clarifier, they'd have maybe eight or 12 or 20 clarifiers. And the advantage of that is that if you need to take some of the clarifiers offline for maintenance, then you don't ruin your whole treatment system. If you had only one with no redundancy, then you'd really be in trouble if uh, maybe a motor fails. So they're still big, though. The purpose of this clarifier is just it's a location where the particles can settle downward. And if we remove the flocks, that improves the clarity of the water. The turbidity is decreasing. And remember, the clay particles themselves aren't dangerous to us. But what's the problem is that a bacterial particle can be stuck on the inside of the clay particle. And so if you swallow the clay particle and digest it, the bacteria can come out of the clay particle and get you sick. So we want to remove any solids that are in solution. As an engineer, you have a few objectives. When you design the clarifier, you want to make it so that all of the particles coming into the clarifier are spread out. I'll show you what that means. You're going to use baffles or sort of a, uh, a distribution system to kind of spread out the flow so there's not a lot of turbulence inside of the tank. Uh, a zone of quiescence. You want to create a location where uh, it it's not sound so much as uh, slow-moving water that is um, desirable. Quiescence means very calm. It's the opposite of turbulence. You know what turbulence is from fluid mechanics. It means the water's going all over the place in very random, uh, high-energy mixing. The opposite of turbulence, quiescence, means just that there's so little liquid velocity that the particles can settle downward without getting disturbed. Because if you think, a particle is moving very slow. If you put your hand in the water and you sort of move it back and forth, that will disturb the particles and their downward settling stops again. So you're not going to put your hand in, but if there was water coming in with a very fast jet, then that would cause turbulence so that the particles settling downward would become disturbed. So we want to avoid any kind of turbulence. The next thing, exit the settling tank without scouring, is related to this same issue of a zone of quiescence. And so we have to get the water out of the tank. The way we do it is by drawing it off the top of the tank very slowly. We don't just have a hole in the side of the tank, because if we did that, the particles that are settling down would be sucked into the outlet. And then we're in the same bad position as before. It didn't remove the particles if they get sucked into the outlet. So we're going to look at the very specialized way that you get water out of a clarifier. It's actually kind of an ingenious solution that uses weirs. You may remember V-notched weirs from fluid mechanics. The other thing is that these particles are going to be accumulating at the bottom of the tank. It's called a sludge layer. Sometimes it's called a sludge blanket which is kind of a funny phrase if you think about a sludge blanket. You don't want a sludge blanket on your bed, right? You want your sludge blanket in the uh, clarifier. So we want to get that sludge out without disturbing the settling zone. So we have to find some calm, quiet way to suck the sludge out of the bottom of the clarifier without disturbing settling. Here's a cross-section of a clarifier that is circular. Sometimes there's rectangular clarifiers. Sometimes they're circular. This is called a circular horizontal flow. And what that means, horizontal flow, is the water comes into the clarifier through the center, and then the water is flowing outward. And I'm putting all these arrows here to indicate that baffles kind of spread it out. We don't want the water to be only coming in a single jet. We want to try and have little holes everywhere 
So with those little holes, the water comes out evenly from all of them. Does that make sense? We want to have it spread. So the water is moving sideways, and we're trying to get the particles to settle. So think, for example, what if the water that came out here has a particle in it? The particle is getting pushed to the side, and because of gravity, it's also falling downward at the same time. So the, traje the trajectory of that particle is at an angle. It's headed downward, but it's also headed to the side. Okay. What we want is we want this particle to touch the bottom of the clarifier before it gets to the end. If we had a particle that was settling very slowly, and let's say that uh, it's going so slowly that it's here, by the time it reaches the side, it'll probably get sucked into the discharge. And that's not good for us. We want it to touch the bottom. So the velocity of settling is V sub S. The velocity of the, of the liquid moving sideways is V sub L. And we can measure both of those just in terms of meters per second or meters per day. And the criteria that you have to remember, the criteria is, if, it, if the particle touches the bottom, then it's considered removed. But if it doesn't touch the bottom before it gets to the edge, then you consider it's not removed. And that's a little bit conservative, that assumption, because maybe if it runs into the side, then it'll settle downward. But to be conservative, we assume that only if it hits the bottom of the clarifier, then it's considered removed. That was a horizontal flow clarifier. Here is a vertical flow clarifier. The water comes into the clarifier from above, and then because of this, this cone, it had the water itself, the liquid has to move upward before it re is removed through this trough. The, the trough, we'll talk about the V-notch weirs and how that works, but the point is that in this diagram, the water isn't moving outward, but it's moving upward. And so whether or not the liquid settles uh, I'm sorry, whether or not the particle settles, the criteria is a little bit different. If the water is moving up too fast, then it's like uh, that indoor skydiving place at Murdoff Mall. Has anybody seen that? The skydiving at Murdoff, Murdoff Mall? People, there's like a tube of air, and someone will jump in. Boy, I am a really good artist, and you're lucky to see this. So somebody jumps in, and the wind is pushing them upwards and they can like fine-tune the velocity of the wind and so they're just floating there. All right? The particle is similar to that because the particle is trying to go down. That's the settling velocity of the particle. But the liquid velocity is going up. So the criteria for does it settle is you just compare the velocities. Here's the liquid velocity. If the liquid velocity is bigger than the settling velocity, it's going to wash those particles upwards and out of the clarifier. But if the liquid velocity is small and the settling velocity is high, then the particle will touch the bottom of the sludge zone, and then we can suck it out, dewater the sludge, and dispose of it. If you're an engineer, and you know there's a certain flow rate of water, Q. There's some Q. How do you control the liquid velocity? The, the mass and the flow rate, that's fixed. And so, you know, there's just a certain amount of water that people want to consume. And so you can't control the demand. The only thing you can control is the size of the clarifier. And so, how do you make it so you have a nice, low liquid uh, upflow velocity. Increase the diameter. Exactly. Because you know velocity is Q divided by A. So the bigger the diameter of that, it's going to spread out the flow over a large surface area, and then the upflow liquid velocity would be smaller. So you have to know a little bit about your particles. You do studies before building a treatment plant. You, you take the water and you do some studies in the lab to see 
how quickly do those particles settle so that you can design the right size diameter for the clarifier. Let's talk a little bit more about the theory so that you can move into the problem solving. Overflow rate is what we call uh, how much loading we're putting onto a clarifier. Now you can see from this diagram that the surface area, the bottom surface area of the tank, we're calling A sub S. And it doesn't matter if it's a rectangular tank or if it's circular, but when, it's, when the particles are flowing horizontally, we need to know what is the area that the particles are going to settle down onto when they fall to the bottom. If you have Q, which is the liquid flow rate, divided by the surface area, then you've got V naught, which is the overflow rate. And it has units of meters per day, meters per second. Uh, and let's look at those units because sometimes they're a little counterintuitive. We've got cubic meters per second per meter squared. So it's like you're spreading out your flow rate, the Q, over a certain area. So cubic meters per second per square meter, and so that, when we cancel the units out, turns into meters per second. That's why it's a velocity. It has the units of velocity. But conceptually, if you're just thinking, what is it actually, it's how much flow rate you're putting into what size of a clarifier. If you have a really high loading rate, that means you're trying to get a lot of water through a clarifier. And that can be a problem depending on how quickly your particles settle. So the safe thing is always to have a really huge um, settling basin. But what's the problem with having a really huge settling basin? It's safe, but it's costly, right. Your client isn't going to like the idea when you tell them, uh, let's have one kilometer by one kilometer square for our settling basin. They'll say, well, I could have put some high rises there. So go back to the drawing board. So you don't want to be too conservative. These are some typical loading rates depending on the nature of the particles. If you're doing coagulation with alum or iron uh, and you've removed turbidity, you, for a rectangular or circular clarifier, you can do about 40 cubic meters per day per square meter of surface area. More if it's upflow. The upflow seems to handle uh, settling a little bit better. That's why you can load it heavier. That's, the bigger number means you're loading it more heavily. Um, but then less loading rate if it's high algae or color removal. Why do you think you can't load it as much? What do we just infer from these values? What do we infer about how well those particles settle? What's that? Yeah, they don't settle very well. The algae particles must be very small because we have to give them more time to settle inside the clarifier. We have to be more careful about how much water we put into the clarifier for a certain given time. So a big number means it settles well. A small number means it doesn't settle as well, so we have to load it carefully at a lower rate. Yes? Upflow is this one. So we're talking about that the water is going up. Yeah, the water is going up, the particles are going down. Um, that's a good question. I, I guess it's just that they don't have data. You know, a lot of algae is kind of a rare thing, and these are kind of rare, so maybe there just wasn't enough places that both had algae and an upflow clarifier, so they couldn't say what's the typical value. Other questions? Yes? Why is it higher here? Um, I think it's because if we look at the diagram, the water, I the water is going up and the, uh, okay, well, I've already got that on there. The water's going up and the particle's going down. There's less turbulence in here because the water isn't moving sideways. It's only moving upward. Compared to the rectangular one, the water is, uh, if this is our outflow, it's moving sideways and the particle's moving down. 
And so I think it's just probably related to it's easier to keep, here is our settling zone. It's easier to keep the settling zone calm in this kind of a clarifier than it is here. And so since it's easier to keep it calm, you can put more water through it. I think it's just related to turbulence probably. Here's another diagram. This is a horizontal flow clarifier. So the water comes in. What are the baffles for? It's to slow the velocity down. If we didn't have this perforated baffle here, then the jet of water comes in, and that jet of water immediately starts to disturb our settling zone. If you just have this open jet, it's streaming in very fast, and then it, it messes things up. So the baffle is to make it so that the water, some of it goes there, some of it spreads out, and so that the velocity is small. It's to make it so we have quiescence inside of the tank. It's to evenly distribute uh, the flow in the inlet zone. The settlement zone, uh, how, how big of a settlement zone you need depends on if you've got particles that stuck together really well and they're falling quickly, or if you have a hard time getting the particles to stick, then you need a larger settling zone. The sludge storage down here at the bottom, you have to decide um, how much sludge to accumulate before you vacuum it out. And I went to a water treatment plant where they only wanted to have trucks come once per week. And so they built their sludge zone. They made a very tall tank because they wanted the sludge to accumulate for seven days. Then they'd vacuum it out straight into the tank, that w the tanker truck that was going to take it somewhere else for treatment. So you have to look at the whole process from beginning to end. Um, if you made this too shallow, then you have to vacuum the sludge out every few hours, but then there has to be somewhere else to put it. Outlet zone, when we get the water into the weir, the weir is designed so that the velocities of the water going out from the tank are small. I'll show you a picture at the end of the lecture that gives you an idea of what the outlet zone looks like. We already talked trajectory a little bit. It's the path of the particle as it's simultaneously falling downward and the water is pushing it to the right. To be removed, we say, the worst case scenario is the particles at the top of the tank. You know, if a particle is lower, then it's more likely that it's going to hit the bottom. But for us, when the water gets into the settling zone, the particle at the top is the one we're worried about. And so we have to look at the difference between the settling velocity and the liquid velocity to find out if it reaches the bottom before the end of the clarifier. Here are some typical settling velocities for sand, silt, clay. We have a formula called the Stokes equation that allows us to calculate the settling velocity for any particle diameter that we want. And today's in-class exercise, I give you a specific particle diameter and I say, find out how quickly it falls through the water. The other thing that depends, that the settling velocity is dependent on is the viscosity of the liquid. So if the water is warm, then it will have a different viscosity than if the water is cold. And how quickly the particle can fall downwards depends on that, as the Stokes equation will show us. Now, this is a little bit more complicated here. And what this is showing is that what if the particle is half of this critical velocity? V naught is the particle that's just barely removed. If the particle that just barely was captured, if it settled downward any more slowly than it was, then it would have hit the edge of it. It would have hit the edge of the clarifier. And we say anything that hits the edge is sucked out and removed. So this particle escapes. You can see that if it had one half of the settling velocity, then it would escape if it started at the top. But the particle that settled at the middle and had half of the critical settling velocity, it still gets captured. And here's our formula that tells us overall the percentage of particles that you can say are removed. 
It's the ratio of the settling velocity to the overflow rate multiplied by 100. Thankfully, this, this ratio is actually pretty easy to predict the percentage of particles that remove. Now, this depends on, it assumes an even distribution of particles across the, uh, across the inlet zone. So this won't be valid if all of your particles are down here, you know, or if all of them are up here. This equation assumes that it's evenly spread out across the entire height of the column. The other thing that this assumes, this is kind of, when we use this, we are assuming that all of the particles have the same size. That's not really true. Not all of the particles have the same uh, size and the same settling velocity because what we know is during flocculation, you know, maybe this one just by random luck didn't have any collisions. And so by the time it gets to the clarifier, it's one particle all by itself. So it's going to settle very slowly. But then just because of randomness, some groups of particles will have had many, many collisions and they'll have a big diameter and so they'll settle fast. And so there's a distribution of settling velocities. In our example today, we're going to gloss over that complicating factor. But in reality, you have to keep it in mind that there's a distribution of starting locations and a distribution of particle sizes and therefore settling velocities. For the clarifiers that we're going to talk about during water treatment, it follows something called type 1 settling. Type 1 settling assumes terminal velocity, that the particle reaches a settling velocity and it keeps going at that settling velocity the whole time as it falls downward, similar to skydiving. Has anybody here been actual skydiving out of an airplane? Nobody? I guess that's why you're here, right? <laughs> Because you're safe, cautious, not doing re reckless thing like skydiving. All right. Well, in skydiving, you jump out and you only accelerate for the first two seconds. After that, it doesn't feel like you're falling anymore. After the first two seconds, it just feels like you're floating and it's really windy. That's what the other thing it feels like. So the thing, same thing is true of these particles, except for they reach their uh, terminal velocity much more quickly than two seconds. They reach their terminal velocity in less than a hundredth of a second. They, they start falling downward and they go the same speed the whole time. That's what type 1 means. For the sludge, oh, I'm sorry, here's the equation that tells you the velocity. Um, we're going to assume a spherical particle and so that the C sub D we use um, and the uh, uh, laminar conditions, it, Stokes' law is, is here for the settling velocity and it depends on g, the gravitational acceleration, the density of the particle. So this density sub s, that's talking about what is the density of either the clay or the algae or whatever it is you're trying to remove. And then this density is just the density of the liquid water, which is a function of temperature. You'll notice it's diameter squared and so it's really good to have big diameter particles. If you double the diameter, what does it do to the settling velocity? It increases it by how much? Factor of four, right. So if you double something and then square it, that means it's four times. So if you get the particles to go from one micron to two microns, they're going to settle four times as fast. And then down here, mu, that's the absolute viscosity of the liquid. So type 1 is what we do for the particles in a clarifier. If you wanted to know how quickly the sludge settles, then there's type 2 settling. And we won't spend too much time right now talking about type 2 settling. But if you take uh, the sludge and you do a little test on it, you put it in a glass cylinder, you've probably seen a graduated cylinder before when you were in chemistry class. If you scoop the sludge out of the clarifier, over time the sludge itself will compress a little bit. And type 2 and type 3 settling have to do with when the particles are bumping into each other as they settle. In, uh, in type 1 settling, you assume the particles don't bump into each other as they're falling. But in type 2 and type 3, the particles or the layer of sludge is interacting with itself and so it's kind of a non-linear relationship in how quickly it goes down. 
So for today, in this in-class exercise, you're going to be looking at type 1 settling. So we'll use Stokes equation. Does everybody have a copy of the handout today for the in-class exercise? Okay. So let's talk through what we have. We've got a rectangular clarifier. The water enters in the left. It exits at the right. And so the particle is, settle, is settling downward, downward, and hopefully what we want, we want the particle to hit the bottom of the tank before it gets to the end of the reactor. Um, the flow rate is 6,400 cubic meters per day. I've given you the clarifier dimensions along with the characteristics of water. The typical viscosity of water is 1 times 10 to the minus 3 newton seconds per meter squared. The density is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And the uh, inflow has a solids concentration of 250 ppm. The diameter is provided. So go through A through F that's on the page there, starting with a little bit of a sketch and the dimensions and so on. And then the uh, calculations, you can use the equations that are provided on the page. Feel free to work with your classmates on this one as you're uh, going through it. Yes? Yeah. All right. So did you get the 80? Yeah. Okay. So if it's 85% that's removed, how much remains? Yes. So basically 15% of this is, this is the original concentration, so 15% of that remains. All right. Let's take a look at the key. The, uh, the dimensions, you know, you, you figure that probably it's not 18 meters deep, right? Uh, although, interestingly, there's a proof you can go through, and it says that actually if you made this twice as tall, it would still have the same performance. Because if you made it twice as tall, then the water would spend twice as long in there, but the particles would have to fall twice the height. So it's kind of an interesting thing that it doesn't matter the volume, it matters the surface area. So anyways, you put the dimensions, critical trajectory. What that means is the one that just barely is removed is the one that hits the bottom just before the end. That's what we need to have as our critical trajectory. So you calculate the overflow rate, settling velocity, where D is going to be the particle diameter that's mentioned in the problem statement. You notice that all of these are base units. So kilograms, meters, a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So they're all base units and what comes out of that is the 33.9 meters per day settling velocity. So 85.8 percent removal. So that's this settling process removes 214 ppm, so what's left is 250 minus the 214 that's removed, and so 36 ppm is remaining. All right? Easy stuff, right? Let's just take a look at how we get the water out of the clarifier. Because it's really easy to mess up settling. If you don't get the water out of the clarifier in a calm way, then those particles aren't going to settle, even if they're big particles. And even if you had baffles, if you remove the water too quick, then you can, um, you can disturb the particles as they settle. So this is a big, long trough, and these are V-notched weirs. I think I have a close-up of a V-notched weir in another lecture. All right. Ignore the algae in this picture. The algae isn't important. What's important is how slowly the water is coming over the weir. You can tell just by looking that the water's not moving very fast. Um, what's the, uh, the equation for liquid velocity that, you know, cross-sectional area, velocity, flow rate? What's the equation? V equals Q over A. If you want to have a small V, 
for some flow rate, if the flow rate is fixed, what do you do to make V small? Big A. That's what this does. It gives the water a big area to leave the tank because we want to have a slow velocity exiting the tank. And so having all these little notches gives a large area. That's the whole point of the V-notched weir. And so if we go back to our slides for today, what we're looking at is just a lot of these little notches because the water moves slow over them. You can't get very much through any one little notch, but if you have enough of them, then that extracts the water you need out of the clarifier without disturbing the settling. Here's another look. And uh, here is a table of typical overflow rates, you know, how quickly you can take the water out of the clarifier through the weir without disturbing the flock as it settles. So a designer would just, you know, do a rule of thumb, take a look at that, and get a sense for how quickly the water is being removed. Once it's out of the clarifier, then you don't have to make it go slow anymore. You can, once it's out of the clarifier, you can pump it back and forth as quick as you need to because settling is finished. All right. Any questions for today? Let's take one final look at these announcements just to refresh our memory of what is going on. That's not it. All right. Remember, part G of the second problem is optional. If you're an overachiever and you want some extra points, you can go on to iLearn and find the uh, supplementary material that covers that. But it's strictly optional. Um, Tuesday is our exam. And we've already talked about that, so I'll turn you loose. Hope you have a great long weekend, and I'll see you on Sunday.